silica, silicone, silicon dioxide, and silicates. Maybe you've heard one or more of these. Are they different? The same? Are they good for you? Bad? Why on earth would you even want or need to use these in foods or supplements? Should you even be eating them? What happens if you do? Let's talk about all this and more this time on Supplementary Knowledge Under the Label with Dr. B. I spent the last 30 years studying health and nutrition. I have a doctorate in public health and have been a registered dietitian for over 25 years. If that's not enough, all my references for this video are in the description below. I encourage you to use these as a starting point for your own study. So, what are these? Let's start with the most basic one, silicon. Chemical symbol SI. Silicon is one of the elements of the periodic table, one of the most basic building blocks of everything on Earth. In fact, silicon is the second most abundant element within the Earth's crust, the land on which we live. Roughly 27% of any rock is silicon. Silicon is rarely found in its pure form. It is most often found in combination with oxygen. The simple combination of silicon and oxygen is called silica or silicon dioxide. So silica and silicon dioxide are the same thing, but silicon is slightly different. It gets a little confusing here as the term silicate refers to silica bound to other minerals. There are many silicates. Quartz is probably the most well known of these and is pure silica. Likewise, sand can also be pure silica, though beach sand has a lot of other things mixed in. Silicone is silica combined with carbon. This combination forms polymers or long chains. This is the stuff that you use to seal your doors and windows and hundreds of other industrial uses. It's not used in foods or supplements, so we won't spend any more time on it here. Like a lot of things in this series, there is not just one form of silica or silicon. Silicas appear in most plants. You actually get a fair amount of silica in your diet. The health of your bones depends on a small amount of silica. You've probably also heard that silica is good for your hair and nails. All true. Unfortunately, your nutritional need for silicon is poorly understood. Since it is needed in such small amounts, it's hard to study. It seems clear that it is a needed essential nutrient, but we just don't know how much is required. Most people consume between 20 and 40 milligrams of silicon each day, mostly from plants. Food and supplements use a variety of forms. You may see such things as calcium or magnesium silicate. However, silicon dioxide is by far the most common name. However, this doesn't really tell you the form used in the product. Silicon dioxide comes in a variety of powder forms and as a colloidal liquid. Silicas are produced in such a way that they have relatively large surface areas. This large surface area makes them really good at holding onto water, air, or most anything else they spray onto or mix with the silica. Colloidal Precipitated and fumed silicas are the most commonly used forms in foods and supplements. They come in different densities, particle sizes, and moisture content. Fumed silicas are the least dense. A couple kilograms, about five pounds of this stuff, will fill the interior of your car. I like to call this stuff powdered air. While most silicas are pretty light, this stuff weighs almost nothing. Regardless of the form used in the product that you're looking at, it'll probably just show up on the label as silicon dioxide. It's worth noting that silica and silicates are used everywhere. They protect rockets from the extreme heat of re-entering the atmosphere. They're used in computer chips. You'll find them in caulk and other sealants. They're even in that ceramic coating on your car and hundreds of other uses. Use of silica materials in foods and supplements makes up a rather small fraction of total silica uses. Why are silicas added to foods and supplements? 
There are several reasons. The most common use is to prevent caking. Caking is a term that describes how some powders will form clumps. This is usually a consequence of moisture accumulation within the powder. Live in a high humidity place like Florida or Southeast Asia, and this could be a significant problem for you. If you live in the desert, it may never be an issue. Like I mentioned earlier, silicas are good at absorbing water. They will take moisture from the powder and the air, preventing it from building up in the powder. These little desiccant packets in your foods, clothing, whatever, they're all largely just silica. A packet works great, but it works even better if you mix it into a powder blend. I put a link in the description below to an Action Lab short that gives a nice visual to this function of fumed silica. The next most common use for food and supplements is as a flow agent. A small amount of silica can make a sticky, cohesive powder flow like sand. Doesn't take much, usually less than 1% of the blend. Now, you have something that will mix more uniformly and pour more evenly. Hopefully, you don't end up with all the powder coming out of the canister or packet all at once, ending up all over the counter, your clothes, and ruining dinner. Silicas can also be used to thicken liquids, reduce foaming, control the disintegration of tablets, and help with the absorption of drugs, nutrients, etc. There are also some very specialized and highly technical uses for silicas, though these uses are not common in supplements and foods. You're more likely to see these in pharmaceuticals or other industries. With how often silicas are used in foods and supplements, is it a danger to your health? The only real health risk associated with silica exposure is when these compounds are inhaled. So be like Bill Clinton, don't inhale. You didn't inhale? Your body will absorb some of the silicon adding to your daily intake. Though these sources will not add much to your overall diet. That is, unless you're not eating your fruits and vegetables. Silicon dioxide is considered very safe with oral consumption. Organizations like the EPA and EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, both consider silicon dioxide to have little or no toxicity. Silicon nanoparticles are a little more complicated. A couple toxicity studies found no oral toxicity or systemic distribution for silicon dioxide nanoparticles in rats at a dose as large as they could physically feed them. The lack of systemic distribution means that the silica did not deposit in any organs within the rats. Although another study did find an increase in silica within the intestines at the highest dose. There is a form called mesoporous silica nanoparticles that can be used as a drug delivery system. While this form tended to increase a number of inflammatory and liver markers, it is not currently used in foods or supplements. Lastly, U.S. law limits the use of silicon dioxide to a maximum of 2% in foods and supplements. Like I mentioned earlier, in most cases, products contain less than 1%. Put it all together, silica is found in the fruits, vegetables, grains, and other plants in your diet, has very little toxicity, and a limit of 2% in your foods and supplements. This makes silica one additive that you need not worry about when used in these products. Silicas are used for a number of specific purposes, though they can all be simplified under the, quote, flow umbrella. Boom. Knowledge supplemented. As always, I've included all the references that I used in putting this video together in the description. Use these as a starting point for your own study on silica. If you found this information helpful, please like and subscribe and leave a comment on what you'd like covered next. It helps out the channel and lets me know what topics are of greatest interest. Thanks for watching. See you next time.